I want to welcome you all this morning to our online video series of uh, study, our class because of the uh, restrictions about distancing. Those of you who have not been with us before, haven't missed anything uh, in this particular study. We just finished 2 Corinthians, and so we're beginning a new series of studies today. I hope those of you who were able to join us for that study were edified, educated, encouraged, and emboldened in your faith to walk with the Lord. I want to begin this study with an allegory based on truth, but structured maybe to fit our current situation a little bit more as far as how we might relate to it. Our story begins with a man who has more wealth under his control than any other individual at any time in the history of the world. You've heard this term as riches, I think it's Crucis or something like that, um, a Greek fellow. You've heard about the Midas touch. They had nothing on this individual. <clears throat> this man controls vast empires around the world and generates more wealth each minute of his life than all but one or two countries in the world generate in their annual, you one slide ahead of me there, Lee, uh, in their annual GDP. There is but one problem. This man only has one child to pass all this wealth onto, and he wishes to spread his wealth beyond his natural family. So he, he sets out, he gets this idea, and he sets out to adopt as many children as possible so that he might spread his wealth, his inheritance, which he is determined to pass along to his heirs, among many, many, many children. And he sets his only heir, his only natural son, to the task of finding suitable individuals, adoptive siblings, if you will, who can share this vast wealth. And truly, no one could be better suited to the task than this son who shares his father's passion for spreading their vast wealth among many. And so the son sets off to find those who would be interested in taking on the family name and participating in the goals of this family, of spreading the wealth to as many as possible. Anyone who accepts the father's and the son's offer must change his or her identity, adopt the family's name, and embrace the family values and goals of spreading this wealth. Many in government and other positions of power feel threatened by this man and his efforts and so they resist this effort by the father and son because they realize that all who accept this offer would no longer be under their control and yet many come many accept the strange conditions of being adopted into this wealthy family. One of the conditions of the agreement which is offered is that like the son, all adopted children must be willing to serve the father's interest in spreading his wealth. In this, they must be willing to share the father's offer to all who will listen. As time passes, Many who have accepted the gracious offer of the son and the father spend increasing amounts of their time just enjoying each other's company on the family estate and become more and more withdrawn from pursuing the original family goal of trying to find more and more siblings, adoptive siblings, to take advantage of the ever-expanding wealth of the family. I mean... 
it's just the more children there that come into the family, the more the wealth seems to be expanding. The adopted children have received all of the benefits of the family name, including all the protections that come with bearing that name. And there comes a time when the father finally becomes so frustrated that in spite of sharing his wealth with so many adopted children, they are not working to accomplish his original goal of spreading his wealth to more and more, but rather seem contented just to bear his name, receive all of the benefits of being his family, and bask in the glory of the family name. In desperation, he calls all of the children home to confront them about their lack of cooperation in helping him accomplish his goal of sharing his wealth with millions of adopted family members. As a family patriarch, he stands before his assembled family members and lifts his head to address them with tears streaming down his cheeks. Did I not make it clear to you all that being part of my family meant that we must continually try to share the inheritance with everyone you were to encounter? A few of you, my children, have been faithful to spread my message but most of you failed to do this. Was it because you felt I wasn't good enough to you? Are you not aware that my only natural son gave up everything, everything he had with me to go out and find you so that his inheritance could be shared among all of you? Did you become tired of bearing my name and receiving the benefits of being my children? Or was it that you, did you decide that you had done enough for me, even though I continue to work on your behalf? I'm just trying to understand. Why? Why didn't you try to reach any others for me? Did you think that there wouldn't be enough for you if you shared with others? That there wouldn't be enough to go around? If I'm standing in that audience, in that family gathering, What answer would I give to the patriarch of the family? I don't know what your motivation for studying the word is or why you might be viewing this video, attending this class. I, I assume it's because you love the Lord and you want to please him, and you want to serve him. But my intention when I study is to try to find out what God wants from me so that I can be a better servant and so that I can come to know him better. I believe that Paul's greeting to the Colossian churches should be applicable to all of Christ's body. He says, in our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because we have heard about the faith you have in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all of God's people. You have this faith and love because of your hope. And what you hope for is kept safe for you in heaven.
You learned about this hope when you heard the message about the truth, the good news, that was told to you. Everywhere in the world, that good news is bringing blessings and is growing. This happened to you, with you, too, since you heard the good news and understood the truth about the grace of God. All who have become part of God's family had to hear the gospel. Scripture even tells us that hearing is key. All who have heard the gospel had to have someone who taught them the truth. The message about the truth, the good news that was told you, Paul says to the Colossians. Paul didn't tell them. He mentions there in that chapter 1 who did tell him, Epaphroditus. I think it's Epaphroditus. There we go. What I must ask myself, what I must ask is what has changed in this process since these words were written in Colossians 1. Has the need for people to hear the good news changed? Hmm. No? No? Has the message about the truth changed? No, the message is... No, it hasn't changed. Has the need for there to be a speaker of the message so that one can hear the message, has that changed? What has changed? I've thought about this when I look in the mirror. And I think it is that those who deliver the message have changed. Do I feel the urgency to share Jesus with others. Am I doing as good a job as those early Christians of sharing the good news so that it, the good news, can bring blessings and be growing? I've wondered, if I were on the crew fishing with Peter and Andrew, Don't know what kind of boss Peter would be. Probably pretty, pretty uh, mercurial. But if I were fishing with him and Jesus came along and said to me, follow me, what kind of apostle would I have been? Wow, it would have been pretty exciting to be with Jesus. Great crowds followed him. You'd get to share in the limelight. You'd get to cast out devils. You'd get to see these miracles. The dead raised. What kind of apostle would I have been? Would I have failed in growing the church? The whole future of Christianity was on the shoulders of those 12 men. Yes, there were others who were telling the news about Jesus, but not the news that was completed after his death and his resurrection and his ascension that the apostles had. Today, if the future of all Christendom, that of all Christianity, of all God's plan for mankind, if all that were on the shoulders of my home congregation and on myself, and there was no other church, what would the church look like in the world in 50 years? 
Will it still be in existence? Wow. Hard questions. Spiritual growth individually and as a congregation, spiritual growth can be uncomfortable, can't it? Yeah. But we are here to entertain each other. We are studying so that we can grow. We are studying to know Jesus. Another question we must ask, why do I want to know Christ? Why? Well, the obvious, of course, is that if you don't know Christ, you don't know God, you don't have future spiritually. But other than that, why do I want to know Christ? Is it an intellectual exercise? Khrushchev memorized, I'm told, memorized all the scriptures. For him, it was an intellectual exercise. And he could spout scripture back to anyone he wanted to. I can't say whether he lived them or not. It didn't appear that he did. Is it an intellectual exercise for me to know Christ, or is it so that I, so that we can become more productive servants? I can't answer that for you, obviously, and you can't answer it for me. But here's what Peter said. Jesus has the power of God by which he has given us everything we need to live and to serve God. There it is. Everything. We have these things because we know him. Jesus called us by his glory and goodness. And then he says down in 2 Peter 1, 5, he says, because you have these blessings, these blessings of he's given us everything we need to live and serve, and we know him, because we have these blessings, do your best to add these things to your lives. So he doesn't say add faith. Faith is a given. Faith is already there. Otherwise, you wouldn't know him, right? So, he starts out with faith, and then he says, add to. To your faith, add goodness. And to your goodness, add knowledge. And to your knowledge, add self-control. And to your self-control, add patience. And to your patience, add service to God. And to your service for, service for God. And to your service for God, add kindness for your brothers and sisters in Christ. And to this kindness, add love. If all these things are in you and are growing, they will help you be useful and productive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The New International Version lists these faith, goodness, knowledge, knowledge, self-control, self-control, perseverance, perseverance, godliness, as opposed to how the New Century renders this service for God. God to godliness, mutual affection, to mutual affection, love, and so on. And verse 8, for if you possess these qualities, in, this is New International, in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The New International and most translations state verse 8 here in a double negative language, which I don't know about you, but I've always kind of found that a little bit confusing because you have to look at it and say, okay, double negative, okay, so a positive if you take two negatives. Here in the new century, it's stated in the positive way. Instead of, if you have these things, you won't be unproductive. Two double negatives, or two negatives, a double negative. 
New Century says if you have these things, you will be productive and useful. Double negatives have the potential to be confusing, so I like the New Century better. Let's focus on that last phrase in verse 6. Other translations render this word godliness, while the New Century translates it as service to God. And they, I think they took a little bit of liberty with that word, but it really is the logical extension of what the original word means. This word, according to Strong and Thayer, is a reverence or respect for God. Well, You can't have a reverence for God and a respect for God. You can't be godly, as the other translations render it, without acts of service. So possibly, even though it's not tightly translated, possibly the new century more graphically conveys the intent, service for God. You decide. You decide. I like the idea of us becoming servants, which implies using all of these other characteristics that Peter lists, most of which have an action component about the only one, well, even knowledge. Uh, you have to do something to obtain knowledge. You, one cannot be kind without acts. One cannot demonstrate Self-control absent living through trying circumstances. Even so, one cannot be godly without serving God. James writes in James 1.26 about how, how lack of control of the tongue makes our religion empty, vain, worthless. Even so, the point I want to glean from these Second Peter verses is that knowledge of Jesus without the action of service is empty, is useless, is unproductive. Knowledge with the actions of self-control, with the actions of patience, with the actions of gaining more knowledge, with the actions of being kind toward brothers and sisters, with the action of service for God with the action of showing love will help you to be useful and productive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see that link between action through service and only through that action are we being useful and productive otherwise our knowledge is just an intellectual exercise it's empty and we're unproductive and we're not useful at least that's how I read it what do you think When were you most excited about being a child of God? Was it right after your baptism? Right after your adoption into the new family, your, your new family? Do you, you remember that day? Alan Jackson sings a song he wrote about 9-11. Those of you who were around at that point or remember that date vividly heard that song over and over. In that song he asks... Where were you on that September day? And so, as opposed to Alan's song that asks if you remember when the world stopped turning, I would ask, do you remember when the light came into your life and your world became brand new and really started turning? I remember that night I can't remember if it was a Sunday or Wednesday. I think it was Sunday, uh, Sunday night. I remember walking to the front of the congregation and sitting in the front pew, as is our tradition. It doesn't happen that 
way, but as is our tradition. I had tears in my eyes as the song that was being sung was only a step. Come for he bled for you and died. He's the same loving Savior yet, Jesus the crucified. I remember leaving the meeting place that night and going to our farm pond, walking with my dad into that water with the mud squeezing up between my barefoot toes, and on the way back to shore, dripping wet, of course, feeling so innocent and so clean in spite of that muddy pond water, I just wanted to jump for joy, just like the lame man that Peter and John encountered on their way to the temple who went walking and leaping and praising God. Jesus has that effect on people when they first let him into their lives and accept him as their savior, doesn't he? Recall the woman at the well in John 4, whom Denny has recently talked about at length in both a, a Sunday morning sermon series on God showing up unexpectedly and in the Double D Wednesday night online class. Because of this recent exposure and the assumption that most of you, at least, uh, who are watching this, also have seen those lessons or heard those sermons. We're going to just briefly touch on her story. You recall Jesus has paused beside the well, midday. His apostles had gone to Sychar to get food. I believe the scripture said he was weary and he wanted to rest. A Samaritan woman comes to draw water. And Jesus begins talking to her, which, because of the Jews-Samaritans relationship, is surprising to her. She is ultimately convinced that this man to whom she is speaking is the long-looked-for Messiah. She's convinced in her mind. And in her hurry to get back to town to share her good news, she leaves her water jar at the well, and she gets back into town, and we can almost hear her breathlessly exclaiming to the townspeople, God, come, come and, and see a man who told me everything, everything I ever did. Do you think, do you think he might be the Christ? So the people left the town and went to see Jesus. Her words apparently emptied most of the town. Didn't they have anything else to do? Probably. Probably. I mean, people always have something to do, right? But her words had been so contagious in their excitement. This woman who tried to stay in the background, who tried to blend in in the shadows yelling this message that all who could leave their tasks and go to listen to this stranger did so. One might observe, yes, but they had been looking for the Messiah. Most folks today aren't. Oh, aren't they? Maybe they're Eyes are just misdirected toward false messiahs, such as the government. Government's going to save us. Or some political leader is going to lead us out of our wilderness. Or some movement. Maybe they're looking to that as their messiah. They're not looking for a messiah? I think they are. Do folks lead their work? Do they lead their tasks to go hear these Messiahs to go follow these messiahs? I mentioned that confronting the truth so that one might grow can be uncomfortable. Leonard, one of our elders here, also mentioned this on Wednesday night. We talk about growing pains. And children do literally have growing pains sometimes if they grow rapidly. We know of reptiles that shed skin, split their skins. Oh, that can't be very comfortable. 
Growth can be uncomfortable. This study is a lot about questions I've been asking myself, and I'm letting you look over my shoulder as I work through some of these difficult answers. So I hope you won't feel condemned or as if I'm accusing anyone, nor do I want anyone to think that I am holding myself up as an example in this respect. I'm, I'm just trying to become a better servant. I'm just wanting to grow. And it's not very comfortable to look at some of these questions. These are questions that I must ask myself, and these are confrontations with God's truth that I need to have. When I read certain scriptures, they kind of smack me in the face, and you, you just get to listen in. And if you desire, ask yourself the same hard question. The important part of this factual story that we spoke about, this Samaritan woman, is that the woman's excitement about Jesus was contagious. These townspeople were looking for something beyond what they had, and many of the Samaritans in that town believed in Jesus because of what the woman said. Did she tell them they had to be baptized? Did she tell them they have to attend service every Sunday? Did she say you have to give up these things that you've been doing? I think I found the Messiah. He told me everything I've ever done. When the Samaritans came to Jesus, they begged him to stay with them. So he stayed there two more days, a little different from his reception in Capernaum. Yes. And many more believed because of the things he said. Did all become believers? Well, probably not. Probably not. The key is that her enthusiasm for Christ was catching, was contagious, and was caught by those to whom she spoke. It was a magnet to draw the listeners to a place where they could personally encounter Jesus. Her enthusiasm was a magnet to personally draw the people who heard her to a place where they could encounter Jesus. It is this initial excitement of realizing what Christ has done for me that I want to recapture. Maybe it's not possible to go back to that innocence and that initial enthusiasm because of all the ensuing years, but it is possible to capture the enthusiasm and the excitement again of understanding where I would be without him. And that's what I want to recapture. Because it can change lives who are looking for a Messiah. Even if it's a false Messiah for which they're looking. Just the fact that that they're looking for something provides an opening for exposure to the truth. We are going to stop there. I've got another example that I want us to look at. And of course, we're just getting started. But I wanted to ask these questions of myself in front of you for you to think about as we launch into this new study. And I hope that you will find this study interesting, stimulating, and uncomfortable because a lot of the questions I'm asking make me uncomfortable.
and I hope you can ask them too. God bless you. We will see you next Sunday. Happy Father's Day.